we're here for John, or John's here for us, I guess, either way, we'll <laughs> take a look at it. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to say a little bit about his background first, you might not know all of this. He's actually Emmett, as in Emmett Judevich, uh, kind of protege, and in fact, when he applied here for graduate work, uh, Emmett, who, was, who retired, but was at UW Stevens, uh, point basically said you've got to have this guy one of the best field botanists I've ever seen. Uh, he actually started at uh, um, University of South Dakota with Molly Nepocroft, one of my former graduate students, but she was leaving for Denver. So she, she uh, suggested um, let's actually go to Madison. Um, you'll, you'll like it there. Um, so uh, he did. He is an expert on the floor of Wisconsin, the Great Lakes, but uh, he decided that um, because systematics has changed a bit, um, he really needed to do some lab work of DNA sequencing and things like that, even though his first love is in the field, uh, working with uh, plants. But he also then um, kind of merged that interest with a long time interest expertise in um, succulent plants. And he's got a great collection. He's uh, helped the, the greenhouse out uh, with it. And I just uh, show you this little um, article. Actually, if you Google John Zaborski, this will come up as the second or third hit. It's an article uh, written by someone else about the Huntington Desert uh, Conservatory. Um, <clears throat> but John is mentioned in there because he's been working on this group of plants, specifically this kind of bizarre plant that you'll see in a second. Well, other weird things like in the grape family, the acer, actually a senecio right here. Um, <clears throat> So he has a keen interest in that, so he wanted to kind of merge his interest kind of in the, in the field uh, with uh, kind of these uh, secular plants, part of the kind of horticultural um, milieu around uh, the world. And this one actually is of interest because um, it's in the sesame family, um, kind of old world, a uh, couple of the genera widespread in Africa, in, in Madagascar, but uh, very difficult to find, in fact, uh, he found many of them in um, botanical gardens um, and through other collectors, but very difficult to actually get these things. So part of the nice thing about being succulents is that there's been a lot of interest in collecting them over um, years. In fact, the only pictures I have of him are uh, at the same place, the same tree that I've used in my uh, courses for a variety of uh, purposes. <clears throat> so you'll hear more about that um, group. Uh, he's been a TA for me for many different courses, plant systematics, vascular flora, Wisconsin, biogeography. Um, back, I'm jealous because he met the first director of Kew Royal Botanical Garden here, uh, Sir Joseph Hooker, uh, who's uh, kind of the first person to articulate vicarious biogeography. Um, uh, this is in um, Kew on one of his visits. There. He's actually looking pretty good, doesn't he? <laughs> is he actually wax or what is this? No, it's an actor. Oh, it's an actor. <laughs> he walks around and talks about okay. his life. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was a wax <laughs> a museum type thing. Okay. He, uh, John's been um, just really great in field related uh, He's on general botany as well, or intro biology, but uh, he really shines in working in the field with students. And this is from one of, the, one of our. Uh, field trips in uh, uh, systematics. <clears throat> he, in fact, um, has taught the last three summer sessions of plant or best in Florida, Wisconsin, um, and kind of ran those courses. So, really, really involved um, with the floor of Wisconsin. <clears throat> He's also been a big help um, to the herbarium in a lot of ways. I'm not sure if anybody has seen his, um, his plant press. I thought mine was big. This is like this, and it's usually full, and usually has a, a hundred things being pressed at once, so he's been accumulating records for Wisconsin. But he's really helped uh, me organize the student herbarium. So we can now, every species in a new folder, updated nomenclature using the Angiosperm Phylogeny Group classification system. So he's been a big help in that. <clears throat> he also has been doing a number of other kind of side projects with the dimensions of biodiversity. Uh, project with Ken Kerman, Don Waller, Tom Gimish, um, and myself. And he has assisted in the barcode of the floor of Wisconsin. He's helped with the trait um, character evolution uh, for all the species that we were looking at. And importantly, uh, because of his field expertise, um, Tom Gimish 
had him become one of the kind of the field assistants to for the population genetic uh, research going on. In so he's been doing a lot of things. He also has a great public outreach, um, high schools, elementary schools, um, but he's been very much involved in kind of uh, pushing the Wisconsin floor in a number of different venues, especially with the Botanical Club. So he's routinely offered these kind of workshops. This is on the lead straws uh, two years ago in this last spring. You probably want to take a break from writing this thesis, so he gave a workshop on grasses. The grasses are his kind of its expertise, which makes sense following Emmett's um, background. And during all of that, he of course raised a family, and uh, so he doubled the family, and uh, uh, kind of juggled a lot of different things. So uh, happy to introduce John, and uh, you can take it from here. So I didn't know how long Ken's introduction of me would be. <laughs> so I put a little bit of an introduction here because I'm not a very sociable person, so you might not know a lot about me. But for one thing, you know that I really like Wisconsin plants, and you're probably wondering why I'm not up here talking about them when I obviously really like them. And Ken likes to show a lot of embarrassing photos of students, but I'll just show my own getting pictures taken with all kinds of interesting things <coughs> from around Wisconsin. So that's the dwarf lake iris. The really I saw my honeymoon for the first time. <laughs> so. And then, of course, <clears throat> you know, the only selfie I've maybe ever taken was with a cactus. <laughs> um, my obsession with plants really started with cacti and succulent plants at a pretty young age, 25 plus years ago, buying them and growing them and trying to learn um, all about them, and then obviously getting my picture taken with interesting ones that I saw. So these are both from Kew 12 years ago when I was there. Um, and then California pointing at a Dudleya that's hidden in the chaparral brush and the Capricolium. And then of course, you know, far, famous, most famous cactus probably. <coughs> so you're probably wondering how does that get into Madagascar? So I was always interested in plants, and especially succulent plants, and then got these two really big coffee table books about the succulent and seraphitic plants in Madagascar, this two volume set. Uh, written by the late Warner Rao, who's a German botanist um, who worked on uh, euphorbias, cacti, bromeliads, uncarina that you can see on the second photo, um, Cal and Kobe, lots of different groups throughout Madagascar as well as the New World. And in these books, I was just like, wow, these are some of the weirdest, most amazing plants you can think of out there. Just a totally bizarre place. <coughs> and so I was just really interested in those, trying to collect those types of plants. And then I got my first taste of really like seeing them in, in, in a real way, I guess, when <clears throat> Pete Lowry and Pete Philipson of the Missouri Botanical Garden were looking for someone to work on the grasses of Madagascar. And so they asked their collaborator, George Schatz, who was also at UW, he was a student of Hilt Sis, somebody might remember him, um, if he knew anybody that would want to take on that project. Well, he did, his old office mate, Emmett, and he, Emmett had a young student, me, that he wanted <laughs> You know, had an interest in Madagascar, so I said, you're going to come as my research assistant and help me there. And then the Pete's were like, you should take on a little project while you're here. So they gave me a little tiny group to work on um, that needed some taxonomic work, and I ended up describing a new species uh, while I was an undergrad. So it was kind of this great you know, experience as a young student, and then carried it on uh, to Uncarina, of course, which is succulent from Madagascar, really, really bizarre, um, but I was always interested in a number of them which are actually now in the greenhouse downstairs. So the, uh, <clears throat> the first part of my dissertation focused on a family-wide study of the sesame family. So it's a pretty small family, only 14 genera, not even 100 species. Uh, many of the genera don't even have more than 10 species described. As you can see from the map, it's mostly restricted to Africa with some outliers. And he's pointing to the center of diversity of the Ambia. <laughs> it's primarily an herbaceous family, but there are some woody taxa to the genera. Um, extremely diverse fruits um, and really unique trichomes, which I'll show you in a little bit. So you probably know sesame, right? So the buns and tahini, open sesame from the <laughs> story. <laughs> and then if you know the comedian Mitch Hedberg, was a pretty dry sense of humor. 
um, found this online. So I think they could take sesame seeds off the market and I wouldn't even care. I can't imagine five years from now saying, damn, remember sesame seeds? What happened? All the <laughs> and at times during my dissertation, I thought that too, like I don't care. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so looking at some of the fruit diversity in this family, um, <clears throat> you've got all pretty much just plays on different types of capsules. Um, some of them are wind ballast, so these fall off the plant and then blow along the ground. These act like a little tack, almost, that an animal would step on and get stuck into its foot. You can see the little prickles on the top there. Uh, these grapple burrs, they're called, they get stuck on hooves and um, also on the uh, feet of like ostriches and other birds. Pretty simplistic capsules in D, um, as well as here in uh, Nigeria. And then really ornate uh, burrs, if you want to call them, that have all kinds of spines and hooks on them in Ankarina. And then very bizarre hairs. So these trichomes are only seen in the Pedaliaceae and nowhere else in the angiosperms. Um, they can either be stalked or unstalked, but they're always topped with a little head made up of four cells, pretty thick in cell walls. And when these hairs are damaged or broken in the presence of water, they release a huge amount of mucilage on so this old black and white photo. This is all like slime coming out of the leaves. What their purpose is is not really known. It could be a herbivory defense, because you can imagine something eating one of these leaves and then getting a mouthful of that. It's not going to want to keep eating that plant. Only recently has the family been investigated in a phylogenetic context. Um, other than this, you know, in very large analyses of angiosperms, especially the lineales, there would just be one or two placeholders from the family, usually on Carina because it's easily found because it's cultivated, and then sesame generally. Um, but in this study that came out three years ago from um, Dick Olmsted's lab, <coughs> they looked at the generic relationships within the family, and with the chlorpolis data that they had, they showed that the three tribes in the family are monophyletic, but that sesame itself is not monophyletic. So you can see that there's four other genera, possibly fit one that they didn't um, sample it, are embedded within sesame. Their ETS data, which is kind of unusual, doesn't show that the Bedelii tribe is monophyletic and that you've got Regeria coming out in the Libya and then another Regeria, but with really poor support on the backbone of that. Um, when we tried sequencing ETS, ours never aligned with theirs, which I found really unusual. I don't know what happened either with our sequencing or theirs, so no way to really test what's actually going on here uh, at the moment. So what did we do? <coughs> we were looking at a date for the Pedaliaceae um, so that we could look further into it with the two succulent genera and see um, when they diversified. So we downloaded a large number of Wayne Ailey sequences from the GenBank um, across the whole order, pretty wide sampling, <clears throat> and then of course within the Pedali AC, and supplemented that with our anchored hybrid enrichment data um, from Florida State University, adding in all the known species of Uncarina and all the known species of Cesalothamnus, and then a couple um, other species of Pterodiscus, which is another somewhat succulent genus in the family. We set a crown date for the uh, Lame Ailey's order of 97 million years ago, um, based on a number of studies that have looked at the Lame Ailey's as a whole, um, because this was always kind of the median age or just a little bit on the low end, but always within that range. And then for this clade, that includes the Sesame family, the Acanthaceae, and then the Martiniaceae, which um, was always thought to be kind of close to Pedaliaceae. Uh, there's a study by Tripp and McDay that had a number of fossil uh, pollen for Acanthaceae, and there, there's no fossils known for Pedaliaceae. And within that study, they got a crown age um, <coughs> for that entire clade of 97, or no, 80 something, if I remember correctly. Um, <coughs> so we used that to get you know, a, a more robust date for the crown of Pedaliaceae. And with that, we got an age of 33.4. Looking within the family then, um, and then this is just chloroplast data, five markers, um, <coughs> we get a lot of major diversification events during the Miocene epoch. And so in this 
split here from these two monotypic herbaceous genera and pterodiscus, which is the other somewhat succulent genus of about 11 million years ago. And then within pterodiscus itself, um, which is a pretty large genus by the standards of the family with 13 species, um, of about 9 million years. Within the clades of sesame, so this is the largest section of sesame, even if you didn't include these other genera that are embedded within it, about 12 million years ago. And then um, <clears throat> the two tribes that are present in India and have the actual cultivated sesame in them, about 8.9 million years ago. Uncarina, about 12, or sorry, sesamothamnus, about 12 million years ago. And Uncarina, about 7 million years ago. So all within this pretty, you know, easily seen uh, block of about the mid, a uh, little bit into the late Miocene. Diversification within all of these lineages. So the Miocene period, globally, but especially in Africa, um, was very warm. There was a lot of seasonality, a lot of aridity, and open habitats as forests um, were kind of you know, getting fragmented by this aridity. And these were all types of habitats that the Dalai you see um, would favor and is currently. So many of the herbaceous plants are very weedy. They turn open, disturbed areas, overgrazed grasslands. Um, some of them are indicators of saline, kind of polluted soil. Um, so you can imagine them diversifying during these times. There's a lot of similar patterns seen in major arid adaptive lineages and succulent plant lineages. So this study from three years ago, <coughs> these lines are a little bit older actually, showed that the cacti showed a major diversification uh, within the Miocene and then into the Pliocene especially. Ice plants, so living stones, the Pizoaceae as well, agaves. And then at the end of the Miocene, you see a very important group of plants too, kind of take over a lot of C4 grasses. Um, diversified during that time when you had all these open habitats and this was more um, conditions favored for the evolution of those groups. We also have evidence <coughs> um, from lineages that couldn't tolerate aridity. So there's a floral pattern within Africa called the ram flora, meaning rim like this that kind of comes down um, the eastern side of Africa and then up through the north. And while some of these arid Adapted lineages kind of show this disjunction, which I'll come into later um, in my third chapter. This study also looked at um, these non arid adapted lineages and that their uh, disjunctions date back to that same time period during the mid Miocene. So they were separated by arid conditions and then, you know, kind of like landlocked into areas that they could handle. So we were interested in looking at. Um, <coughs> historical um, ranges within the family. And so we use biogeo bears um, to investigate that, and it shows that there's an origin for the family in southern Africa, as, as had long been suspected, because most of the species are there. Um, there's a lot of narrow endemics in that region. <coughs> and then subsequent range expansions to Madagascar, the Thunkarina, into eastern and northern Africa, and then as well as um, India with cultivated sesame and then its progenitor and another species that grows there. We could not get um, extra or uh, more collections, I guess, of this genus Josephinia, which occurs three species throughout Australia and Malaysia and then one in Somalia and Kenya. Um, so a very weird disjunction, um, but not unheard of like with the Bale maps. But um, people that I tried to contact said that they wouldn't send anything working on that. So we don't really have any way to see what was going on there, unfortunately. <clears throat> so we can see that these range expansions occurred during the Miocene as well. Um, so we can think of that potentially, um, you know, as these arid habitats opened up, it allowed for these lineages to move outward. So like this pterodiscus and pedalium, pedaliodiscus, moving from southern Africa into eastern Africa and then up to the Horn of Africa, <coughs> um, as well as Dexrocarium, and then Sesame itself moving out of Africa and into India, either long distance dispersal or potentially through you know, the Middle East and then becoming extinct within that area. And then of course, long distance dispersal to Madagascar itself. <coughs> My second chapter then focused more on Hunkarina, a very taxonomically challenging group, as 
It's the second largest genus in the family, endemic to Madagascar. Um, succulent shrubs and rather small trees, the largest members of the family are in this genus. Some of them are pretty widely distributed in Madagascar and others um, have pretty narrow ranges, possibly because of just the rampant habitat loss on the island. Um, and it's just really contracted the ranges. Um, this is Jean Henri Humbert, who wrote the floral treatment for the group for the flora of Madagascar back in the late uh, 60s, early 70s, and was really the last person to do any kind of like taxonomic work on the family. And it's made more difficult by the fact that specimens are usually really bad for this <laughs> uh, genus. So oftentimes this is what they are. They're a couple of fruits taped to a sheet and like some leaves that people collected off the ground. They don't collect the branches for some reason. Maybe they're kind of hard to press, but at least all the historical specimens and the types are all really terrible to work with. <clears throat> Oncarina has some amazing fruits um, that just look really wicked. Um, I have a couple because my plants have actually produced them uh, a couple times. And they really get stuck even into your skin and it can be kind of hard to remove. There's a lot of variation within the genus in these fruits. You have this one species with really, really long um, spines and then all these spines will have like four backwards pointing hooks on them and then extra spines sometimes between those rows of really long spines. Some of them have really broad wings on the sides or a really long beak as well. Um, apparently there was on NPR Science Friday when I was looking for images of the fruits. Um, they had somebody wrote a book about seeds, but they were showing pictures of fruits on the website. Um, and they gave this awards for the different fruits and they gave best dressed to <laughs> the rhino because of all the spines on it. Um, there are reports in the literature that native Malagasy people use them as mouse traps and just leave them on the floor and mice get stuck in them. And I read on a blog of someone there that said that they looked under a tree and there was a snake stuck in the fruits and it had died because it crawled into them and couldn't go anymore because it was so weighted down by them. So very, very wicked fruits. <clears throat> Morphologically, like I said, um, small shrubs, some kind of large shrubs, two smallish trees, so 12, 14 feet tall. Um, but all of them with pretty swollen bottle stems of this bottle tree look. Really pretty large bilabiate flowers that you'd expect for something in the Lamy Ailes. Um, almost all the species have yellow flowers. There's one species with white flowers and then two species with bright pink flowers as well. And then a lot of variability in so you can have, in some species, these very shallowly low, very broad leaves that will be very, very hairy. Um, <clears throat> some of the species have almost digitate leaves, so really, really deeply low. Um, some with very few hairs on the leaf surfaces, and then these really pronounced white veins. So, and they're very variable within an individual. So like our mulberries around here, the leaves early on in the season will have a different shape than those later in the season will become more deeply lobed as the season progresses. So it makes identification pretty difficult. <clears throat> so I had a lot of trouble over the years using Sanger sequencing on these. Couldn't get different things to amplify either because of my own ineptitude in the lab, because I'm a field guy, like Ken said. <laughs> or when you try to extract DNA from these leaves, even when they're dry, you're just pulling all that slime out when you're pipetting, and it's just awful. Like, I've had it, you pull it out, and there's just this incredibly long string of slime coming with it, and you can't get it to stamp. It's just a, a horrible mess. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> luckily, we sent stuff off to FSU for anchored um, phylogenomics, and surprisingly, it worked, and I was just amazed that all of a sudden this stuff came back, and they wondered it must have been my fault that it wasn't working <laughs> and not the plants. Um, but we sent 20 samples to them, multiple accessions of some of the species, and got back. Uh, a little over 500 single copies of your genes for almost every one of the species. And then from that, uh, we were also able to extract chloroplast DNA. Looking at the nuclear phylogeny, we see that Uncarina is monophyletic. Um, there's very strong support for a lot of previous hypothetical species relationships. And then really strong morphological and geographical signals. And then that there's also a cryptic species in here. So you can see that Uncarina sacalava. Um, which we'll get to a little bit later, is not monophyletic, which is pretty exciting to see. Um, uh, you know, a hidden species in there where a lot of species have been described in the last 10 or so years. So, 
So geographically, <coughs> we can see that there's four major clades um, in the, the genus. There's a pink clade, so the two species with pink flowers are sister to one another. And then they, in turn, are sister to the rest of the family. And you've got a southern clade, so species that occur in just the southern part of Madagascar with one little outlier up here. And then a northern clade, so most of them are up here, but there are a couple a little bit to the um, southwest. And then a western clade along the, the western dry half of that highland. So the two pink flowered species that have long been thought to be closely related, we show that so the nuclear data, they are very closely related. They have very, very different fruits from one another, but they're both fairly large trees. Um, they have similar looking leaves, pretty similar looking trichomes with a pretty stellate type of head or at least elongated arms to those um, apical cells. And then of course the pink flowers that look um, very close to one another. In the southern clade, <coughs> these three species, and, and this one as well, I'd always thought to have been close to one another as well. Um, their flowers and their fruits are almost indistinguishable. You have to use the leaves to tell them apart as well as the growth habit. So Uncarina Rusliana is a very dwarf species um, with just a single stem and then a really big underground tuber. And then the other two are smallish trees. But they have, and I'll get back to this in a little bit, slightly elongated apical cells on those heads as well. This recently described and really rare uh, Uncarina turcana has a more like buttony cushion type of head to it that I call it. It's like an old tiny cushion with a button in the middle. I don't know if they have a name for that, but I remember my grandmother having them. <laughs> um, is also part of this group. And it shares a lot of characters with a lot of other groups. So it's kind of an unusual species. <clears throat> so looking at the morphological data with the northern and the western clades, Almost all of them have hairs that look just like that or something on that, so that really distinct, kind of sunk in the middle, kind of button cushion look to it. Um, these two species from the north have very shallow lobes and very hairy leaves. Um, <coughs> these three species have more pentagonal leaves um, with very pronounced white veins and very sparse covering of hairs. Sakalava is obviously kind of a mess that I'll get to in a little bit. And then these last uh, three tags, so these two being pretty recently described, um, have very acute, deep lobes in the leaves and also very pronounced white veins and usually kind of a sparse covering of hairs. <coughs> uh, so looking at the chloroplast phylogeny, we see that there's kind of a mess going on now, unfortunately. <coughs> now we've got a geographical signal still, but now the pink flowered species are in a clade with the rest of those southern species. And if you remember, those all have mucilage glands with, that are slightly stellate or just slightly elongated, so they do have that feature. And they're all kind of clustered in the southern part of Madagascar. Then this more northern clade, all of these have very shallowly lobed leaves. And then in this clade, which is the messiest, um, all of these have pentagonal leaves, sometimes very deeply lobed, but not always, and very pronounced white veins and very sparsely hairy leaf surfaces. And then Turkana, which you remember in the nuclear tree was coming out with these southern species, is now part of more of this western clade. And its mucilage glands and fruits look more like those species than uh, like the southern species it groups with in the nuclear tree. So there's a high level of discordance, but still a geographical signal. So now this is the clades map from the chloroplast phylogeny. You can see more northern, very wide ranging western. And then the southern that now includes those pink flowered species, which the one of your DNA gets a little bit farther north. <coughs> so there's still, I just showed you morphological signal within that chloroplast phylogeny. And then the interesting placement of the U Sakalava accession, which is actually point out. So one of them here, U23, it is grouping with these northern species, and then the other one, U22 is grouping with these more western species. So U22 is from the southern portion of the range of the species, so it's got a disjunct range, which is interesting. Um, it was collected, my sample that I used, about 65 miles north of the collection of the holotype. And then this U23 is from the northern portion of its range. And part of the problem is that Humbert described it 
I think he described it very broadly, and he designated a bunch of pair types, and even wrote in the descriptions, I don't think these are the same things, but I'm designating them anyway. And one of them has actually recently been shown uh, to be a different species and not um, part of Sakalava. So there's a lot of work to be done, um, more collecting, and, and hopefully get a loan of these and kind of figure out what's happening. What is interesting is that my U22 um, accession that's near the holotype more closely matches the holotype description than the northern um, collection, which has um, the ratio of simple hairs in the mucilage glands um, and their location on the leaf different than any other described species. So it's pretty clearly, even from the few leaves that I've got uh, in the freezer, that it's quite a bit different from typical Sakalava, whatever that may be. <coughs> so here's a tangogram showing the nuclear and the chloroplast phylogenies next to one another. And you can see that there's a lot of discordance going on here, especially with the northern and the western clades, uh, where things are, are switched back and forth. And you saw there's a lot of weird branch lengths going on too that we're um, still investigating and looking at. Um, <coughs> when you look at all of these, the chloroplast um, alignments in genius, what's also really weird is that some of these, Uncarina leandriae, which is a western, pretty wide ranging species, has a bunch of regions identical to regions within Ragusliana, which is a really narrow endemic in the far southeastern part of the island. So the ranges don't overlap at all, but they've got all these regions that they match on, which is really strange. So to kind of investigate this level of discordance within here, um, with the help of Jeff, ran this incomplete lineage sorting test that he also did for polymonium, where you simulate gene trees um, for the organeller and then the nuclear genome. And I'm still working on understanding completely the, the statistical methodology in it. Um, but it generates fake gene trees that you might need to explain how many um, extra lineages are involved with this incomplete lineage sorting. And our observed number of extra lineages is way outside of that, so this dashed green line. So we can't explain all this discordance with just incomplete lineage sorting alone. So there are some possible areas of inversions that we've seen in the chloroplast, and we're going to keep investigating that and see what's going on. And there's potential for ancient hybridization as well, especially you can imagine with these northern and western species overlapping quite a bit, and however they dispersed into that part of the island, there could have been um, you know, numerous interventions back then. So another area where there's a lot still to be discovered. <clears throat> so dating the genus, the really unusual topology and the branch lengths, um, we got really wild, very old dates um, for Uncarina, which I won't show here. Um, so we use the nuclear data because it is so strong to support in there. We've got a fairly uh, mid-Miocene uh, to late Miocene uh, crown date of 11 million years for the genus, and then subsequent diversification within it, within the late Miocene into the Pliocene, and then the, you know, the northern, the western, and the southern species clades as well. <coughs> and then looking at Biogeo bears for the genus, constructed as um, at least the ancestor was in southern Africa, and we know that it's sister to Regeria, which has a number of species in Namibia, and then disjunct another species that runs in a really narrow band across the bottom of the Sahara and doesn't get any farther uh, south than that, so unusual distribution. But we can see that there was a jump to Madagascar, subsequent you know, range expansion within the arid, the sub-arid spiny forest, the really famous part of the southern part of the island where all the weirdest succulents are. And then a range expansion into that really wide uh, western dry forests and open areas within that part of the island. And then within these two narrow endemics, a kind of shift into this very small area of subhumid forest that kind of comes up into the little northern tip. And then those two Uncarina grow in those two areas. So <clears throat> interesting diversification and range expansion in the genus coming in from the south. And then the final genus <coughs> that I covered was another succulent one, Sesamothamnus. 
Um, the only other you know, easily robustly woody plant in the, or genus in the family. Um, confined to Africa, just six species known, some of them with very narrow ranges. Uh, four in southern Africa and then two in northeastern Africa. All of them are succulent shrubs with very small leaves, dry deciduous, really unusual spines um, where the spines form from the petiole, so the leaf blade actually falls off and then the petiole becomes hardened and forms a spine. And moth pollinated flowers. <clears throat> One species was discovered from Namibia in 1957 and no one has ever described it, even though it's in cultivation. And why no one has described it is a total mystery to me. Even talking to Hans Dieter Illenfeld, who's a German, who's the authority on the family, and he wouldn't even give me an answer about why no one had described it. So it just seems like it's just waiting for someone to do something with it. And it's got a nomen nudum, at least. <clears throat> so you see this disjunction pattern in the genus that's shown in a lot of arid adapted lineages within Africa. So they will have one or more species in the southern part of Africa, especially within Namibia and Angola, and then there will be none of them in between, and then there will be more species up in the Horn of Africa. <coughs> um, there's also, and they're all, you know, like I said, arid adapted, but there's also confusing continuous distributions of other arid adapted taxa like Euphorbia and Aloe, Calanco as well. So you've got all these different you know, elements of an arid flora, with some of them showing this disjunction and others showing the continuous um, range. Many of the taxa are poorly known because it's just so hard to collect in this part of the world, unfortunately. I mean, you look at you know, like the Q database, there's like one collection, and it's the type, and people aren't gonna let you destroy that. Thing. Or it was pickled, so you can't even use it for DNA, unfortunately. So, <clears throat> an interesting question that has come up is when do these taxa become separated? And there have been hypotheses that it um, was this Jurgen's person <clears throat> that this was caused by the Miocene aridity that we've seen with other aspects of the family, and that when this region became less arid later on, it split these ranges of these. And so <clears throat> there's a proposal, or a hypothesis, I guess, that there's an arid corridor that existed probably more than once through this belt of high rainfall within Africa, present-day Africa. And so during these times in the Miocene where there was you know, increased aridity, that would have been opened up, or at least fragmented in such a way that these arid lineages could move through it, either you know, directly through it, um, or kind of like jump dispersal through these little uh, patches as if they were islands. And there's a number of plants, like another succulent, Dinium, that show this, and some animals, like some African ground squirrels as well, have this disjunction. There have been some recent dated phylogenies, like this one, on the side of Felaceae, um, showing that the northern, and, or sorry, northern and southern species are, or clades are sister to one another, and that their divergent states match the mid-Miocene into the Pliocene, in some cases, when there would have been increased aridity, and when you would have expected this to be open, allowing them to migrate back and forth through there. And then once that you know, formed a present day, splitting these groups and not allowing them to move anymore. So within Sesamothamus, <coughs> we got a lot of nuclear genes back for that as well. And looking at that, phylogeny and we've got strong support for the monophyly of the genus and then very strong support for southern clade and northern clade so the two species that occur in Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya are sister to one another and then within the southern species we've got a Namibian one um, sister to one from eastern South Africa and then the Sesamothamus lysenri that's the one that's never actually been uh, described sister to another narrow endemic that's in Namibia and just reaches into Angola. Um, <clears throat> the flowers within the group have always been kind of interesting uh, because they're not like the flowers in the rest of the family because they're you know, moth pollinated whereas most other ones are expected to be bee pollinated. And the presence of a nectar spur has been thought to be an important character and um, I've seen a little bit um, that the hypotheses about those are not necessarily true. So the northern species both have spurred flowers. 
Um, this Namibian one has a little bit of like a sac-like protrusion on it, not a definite spur. Um, the Southern African one, or South African one, is spurred. Uh, this Namibian and Golden one is spurred, and then there's no spur on that undescribed species. Looking at the chloroplast, phylogeny, strong support in there, and an identical topology. So it's not like a Carina where it was just a disastrous mess. Um, <coughs> we've got strong support for a northern clade and then a southern clade as well. Looking at the dating um, within the nuclear chronogram, the dates are very similar in the chloroplast. I didn't put it in just for the time's sake. Um, but we can see that there's a split in the mid Miocene between the northern and the southern species. So you know, when there was that time of aridity, ancestor could have dispersed into the north and stayed in the south, and then they were split at some point um, and unable to move back and forth. <coughs> and then subsequent diversification um, in the late Miocene within the southern species. Looking at Biogeo bears in here, we can see that this originated in southern Africa and then had a range expansion into the horn of Africa. So this is the undescribed species. So a mid-Miocene origin and diversification of the genus that we saw um, with other genera in the family, chapter one. And a very clear geographical split with the north and the south species with range expansion potentially via that African arid And then, most interesting is that the past hypotheses of Illenfeld, who's again the expert in the family, of species relationships within here are wrong. So he thought that this Sesamothamnus lysenrii uh, was the most primitive member of the genus. It has a very, very narrow range. He thought it was kind of relictual. Um, he thought it was really primitive because it has no spur on the flowers. And because of foliar characters, he thought it was very closely related to the northern species. Um, because it has a very sparse covering of hairs, just like the northern ones do, but we show that it's fairly recently, uh, fairly recent species, and that it's with the southern species as well. And then he also thought that the Garicii uh, was intermediate between you know, this primitive one and the rest of the group because of the really small nectar sac that it has and not uh, the long nectar spur. Um, but we showed that that you know, is not necessarily true, that Probably the spur length has been at least lost once in Lysenrei and perhaps just shrunk um, in Garicii. So, definitely more uh, things that could be done with this, and especially you know, collecting this other species a little bit more um, and investigating more about it and just actually describing it because even finding characters that it shares with the other known species is hard because it doesn't have a formal description. So, you know, looking at um, shared characters or things that are different, um, it's actually kind of difficult. So with that, I'd like to thank a large number of people because I can't do this alone. So the members of my committee, um, and David and Ellen, uh, who served on the committee earlier in the process, and especially Ken, because I was not always the best student, <laughs> or the easiest student, maybe. And actually, last week, so obviously I've been thinking about this day for a lot, I had a really weird dream where I gave my defense, and afterwards Ken stood up and he announced that he was retiring, and he specifically <laughs> said it was because I was so exhausting. <laughs> so I'm hoping that that's not good. I remember waking up and I was like, oh my god, I'm just trying. And of course, everyone in our lab, uh, Jeff, Ricardo, Chloe, and Alexa, who's out in the field, um, especially Jeff, who has been so patient and helping with a lot of stuff. And then other members, my allergy medication's not working. <laughs> <laughs> of the department that I've become friends with, so Kristen Michaels, and recently graduated in NISA, of course. And then my first TAs that I ever had, Bob Warnerail and Matthew Pace. All the administrative staff that have come and gone since I've been here for seven years. I was trying to think of everybody that had done something for me at some point, usually with teaching the summer course and all the extra crap that comes with that, and you know, students doing this and students doing that, um, and Mike as well for being my other uh, teaching advisor like Ken was. The herbarium staff, Marianne and Mark, and then of course the greenhouse, Kara and, and Mo, thanks for coming. The people who helped me gather leaf materials, so Dan Mars, a retired professor from the Department of Entomology who travels 
uh, throughout Namibia and Africa a lot. Walter Rusley, who is this very cryptic, uh, rich Swiss guy who sent me material. He collects in Madagascar a lot, has this big Ankarana collection. I contacted Hans Dieter Illenfeld, and he said, oh, I'll talk to Walter. And Walter's personal assistant emails me and says, we can send you those leaves. David for Walter is how he signs his emails. Whenever I email Walter, it's always David for Walter. So he's a weird guy, I guess. I've never actually talked to him. And then the staff at the Huntington Botanical Garden for helping me when I was there um, collecting leaf material and just nerding out about succulents. Um, and then my botanical mentors, too. So Emmett, Bob, and of course, Ted who I really strive to be like in terms of how good of a botanist I am. And then, of course, my family, Emily, my wife, and then my daughters. And my parents, even though they voted for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> my in-laws, who did not. So, <laughs> obviously, there's a lot of uh, issues. <laughs> and I'm an only child, which makes it awkward. So. And then funding from the department, and also, obviously, the Cactus and Succulent Society of America. So, thank you.